All right, everyone. Um, thanks for coming and welcome to Policy at McCombs. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we're good? Okay, great. So it's a pleasure to have Ryan Streeter with us today. Uh, a lot of what we're doing here started with the work that Ryan started here at uh, the, at that time it was UT CPG, the Center right. for Politics and Governance, mm -hmm. that I, I was happy and lucky enough to inherit it and turn into SEPA now, and we're, we're trying to push the work forward. Um, Ryan, since leaving us, went to the American Enterprise Institute, and, and he's the director, I'm gonna get it wrong, of the domestic policy research the research group and uh, we're excited to have you here today and, and thanks yeah. for coming back yeah thanks for having me back yes and we're gonna do a little bit different this time we're gonna have him talk for about whatever 30 40 minutes and then we're gonna have questions all, all open all right thank you sounds good thanks well it's good to be be back and see some familiar faces and some new ones uh, as well uh, it's been two years since I left here I can't believe it's been been that long but uh, it has been and uh, little known factoid, my very first office when I came to UT was in this building, actually. Yeah, when, uh, when I was hired to come and, and start CPG, it dawned on um, the administration uh, pretty much the week I was moving that they had forgotten to actually figure out where my office was going to be. So McCombs was very hospitable. Uh, and so I actually got to know this building a little bit uh, back then. So it's good, it's good to be back. Um, I, I probably won't speak for that entire allotted time. I'm, I'm a, a discussion-oriented sort of presenter, and so I would welcome your questions even along the way if you'd like. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is just walk through some recent uh, survey research that we've published at the American Enterprise Institute and talk a little bit about what I think it means just for um, some policy implications and then also just some broader um, cultural uh, implications as well. Um, this this uh, project was something that we uh, launched. We, we went out and found some, some funding for, for this so that we could do um, kind of a battery of questions that takes you a few levels below uh, what's very common in public opinion research today, which really focuses a lot on opinions about what's going on in the nation, uh, political attitudes, and, and, and all the various kind of uh, variations on that. We wanted to kind of revive some of these questions that uh, go um, back to um, Putnam, some of what Putnam asked when he was doing a Saguaro seminar work, se seminar work and all the questions on social capital, things that Roper used to ask, some things that Pew used to ask, to try to get a sense of whether or not during these very divisive times, and we know that's, we know that's true, we know that people are very polarized and, and divided in terms of political uh, identification and, and the like, and that's, that's grown wider over time, but is, is that the complete story of what's kind of going on in American life right now? Are, are people bitter kind of all over the place and about everything? And the only way we could know the answer to that question was to ask people a lot more questions than they're typically getting asked in the current surveys that are out there. And it's, you know, we, we had a, a, our survey, uh, I think of, of its results that we'll continue to analyze. We've issued our initial report. We'll, we'll continue to analyze them and do some sub-reports on sub-issues, kind of falling in this, this tradition of these, these various uh, works that you see up here, some of which you may know, some of which you may, may not. We wanted to understand how people feel about their communities. Are they good places to live? Are the communities moving in the right direction? Do people um, have friends? Uh, do they have people they can rely on in times of need? And is the loneliness epidemic that we keep reading about an actual thing? Um, is, is it uh, as bad as people say it is? Um, what are its dynamic uh, features? And um, the American dream as well, how does that play out in people's lives? How do they define it? How do they understand it? So we wanted to, to figure out um, a lot more about what's going on in American life uh, at the level beneath and beyond um, kind of the, the, these national issues. And so we, um, so we did the survey with NORC at the University of Chicago, and uh, I can, if you're interested in, in the, the details of it uh, and its genesis, I'm happy to, to follow up with anyone by, by email and, and share with you as much detail as you would like. Um, we, we did this survey last summer, um, and uh, it's a nationally representative sample with uh, over 2,400 uh, completed uh, surveys. It took people about 45 minutes to do this survey. It was very long, so there's a lot, a lot of data there. And so the key points, which I want to, I'll, I'll walk through these now, then I'll show you some charts and graphs, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about what I think it means in terms of implications. And then really, I'd just rather have kind of a conversation with you, get your thoughts on, on some of, of these, these and, and related themes. Um, so one thing that emerges from this survey data is that Americans are more optimistic about their local communities than they are about the nation as a whole. Uh, when you ask people about uh, life on the ground, um, the, the kind of bitterness that you, 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 you get from the surveys that ask people purely about national issues and how they feel like the, the country's going and how they feel about our national political leaders, that starts to, to kind of dissolve. 
Um, a second thing is uh, social infrastructure matters and brings people together. I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit more in the slides to follow, but we, we asked questions here about uh, community amenities, uh, what people value in their communities, what they're close to, what they're far away from, and found some interesting um, data there as well. Uh, the American dream, um, keeps, it, everyone keeps saying it's dead, but when you ask actual Americans about the American dream, it doesn't seem to be dead. Um, and then uh, loneliness epidemic, um, is it an epidemic? Um, I tend to think it's probably not, um, but we'll, we, can, we can talk about that and debate it later on. Brian? Yeah. At the risk of incurring Carlos's wrath, let me ask you this. Um, do you think the issue of redistricting is something that affects people? It's, it's, has it made us more socially fragmented? Than um, I, there are other experts in the room who can probably give a better answer to that question. What I, what I would say is that um, our survey results don't really help us with um, understanding a whole lot about the role of like homogeneity in communities and driving these responses as well. Knowing what we know, my guess is it probably does to, to some, some degree. Um, but the, the redistricting side of this, that's, a, that's a kind of a very complicated thing. And I'm, not, and I'm not really sure about its role in some of these data. But I'd, I'd welcome people's thoughts on this as we, as we go along. So when you, when you ask people how they feel like the country's going and then whether or not they're satisfied with life in their lo local community, you see this kind of difference, right? You, you have um, a, dis a, dis a majority of people being dissatisfied with the direction of the country, a minority of people being satisfied with it. Um, that, as uh, you may know, uh, is driven a lot by just partisanship. Um, if you're a person's in the White House, you generally tend to think the country's going in the right direction. So up until 2016, Democrats thought the country was going in the right direction. Now Republicans are more likely to think the Republicans going, the, the Republic is going in the right direction. The country's headed in the right direction. Um, but partisanship seems to play no role when you ask people about their local communities, uh, whether they're very satisfied or fairly satisfied with their local community. Um, it breaks out pretty evenly among partisan affiliation. And surprisingly, among other types of demographic breakdowns as, as well, as you might expect, there are income and race effects in dissatisfaction with community. They're not as pronounced as you, as you might think. Um, but generally, in, in almost every demographic category, you'll see um, about three quarters of people saying they're satisfied to some degree with, with how life is going in their, in their communities. Um, and, uh, and then here's another, another way of looking at the, the data. So um, I mentioned the, the the partisan thing, um, you see that that effect, and this was you know this was done last summer, when not only was Trump in the White House, but the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, and you see the Republicans think the country's moving in the right direction, Democrats largely don't, and Independents uh, uh, are somewhere in between, and then um, the and even though Republicans seem to be happier with life in their their local communities, those numbers uh, majorities are fairly significant across the the board. And so when we, we ask people to um, rate their community, whether it's a good, excellent, or fair, or poor place to, to live, uh, you see the breakdown sort of this way. I mean, about half of, of Americans will say that, they, they're, uh, that the community where they live is a good place. Um, about a third say it's excellent. And then you see the, the fair and poor uh, breakdowns there as well. And you see these, these same sorts of percentage, percentages, kind of from 3 quarters to 80% sort of prevail in these other uh, categories that we asked about. These are just uh, examples. These aren't uh, everything that we asked. Um, that whether you feel safe walking alone in your neighborhood at night, um, a, a significant number of people, um, again, across income and demographic groups, uh, generally do feel safe in their communities. And also, um, people pretty, pretty impressively believe that if they were asked by their local public officials to do something like conserve water in an emergency or something, that they, they believe they live in a community where people would actually do that. Perceptions of amicability. Do people get along with each other pretty well in your neighborhood? Yeah, eight and 10 say pretty well or, or very well. And, um, and even though people may not help each other uh, as much as they believe people are helpful in their neighborhoods, uh, a lot of the, the belief that people live in neighborhoods where uh, their neighbors are fairly willing or very willing to help out is, is about three quarters of the, the population. Um, and then you can see these, these questions of social trust as well. Do you trust the people in your, your neighborhood? Um, the, um, the about, again, about half uh, check the second category, some. And then you see the, the, the breakdown among, among the others. So um, there are, we, we can talk a little bit later about what sorts of things drive social trust, what sorts of characteristics are, are found in, in the people that, that feel like they trust others in their neighborhood. But generally, um, 
when it comes to locality, people are fairly, fairly trusting of where they, they live. Now, we ask people where you get a, a strong or some or no sense of, sense of community. And we don't define sense of community. We allow people to, to uh, impose their own definition of that on how they answer the question. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, you know, the most of us would say we get a strong sense of community from our friends um, and some sense of community from our friends. That's, that's perhaps not, not surprising. Um, you'll see that, that uh, uh, living in your city uh, is a, a relatively strong sense of identity. People, people get an identity from living in Austin. Austin has a particular identity. You, you get some sense of community from that. Um, you think about your hometown or your, your home you know, sports team, and <laughs> it's like all of us reserve the right to be critical of the towns we're from, but if you meet someone who criticizes your hometown, you're kind of defensive. You know? even, though you never, you, even though you never picked it, right? Like if, you, if your parents moved there when you were little and you grew up there, you still are defensive. It's like your name, right? <laughs> Most of us didn't pick our name, but if someone makes fun of it, we, we, we feel like it's our thing. And, uh, and we feel that way about our, our communities, where we're from. And, uh, and, and have a sense of identity from, from that, to some degree anyway. Um, the American identity question I was also surprised by. I didn't expect to see 75% of Americans saying they get some or a strong sense of community just by being an, an American. That would be a non-local sort of national kind of abstraction, but it seems to be a real thing. And it's, it's a fairly um, uh, robust finding throughout uh, various demographic groups. Um, uh, a little bit less is, uh, is your neighborhood, the people that you live with in, in your immediate area. Still 71% of people um, say they get some or, or a strong sense of community. And then, and then the workplace, uh, uh, school or work, I would have thought would have been a little bit higher, but that, those are the, the results. Um, your political ideology or people uh, who have similar perspectives was at 64%. And I thought that was interesting that, that really the, there's a difference between um, political ideology and just the neighborhood or city where you're, you're from. Um, if you consume national news and you spend a lot of time on social media, you would think that, that the, the identity question is a, is a really important one. It is actually um, uh, people with higher levels of education do get a stronger sense of community from people who share their political ideology. It still doesn't rival the city numbers, but it's, it's higher among more highly educated people than it is uh, working class and lower educated uh, people as, uh, as well. Um, and then people who share your ethnic uh, background comes in at 58%. Place of worship, that's, that's a function of how many people actually go to a place of worship. So people who people actually do go to, a, a, when you look at the people who, who actually regularly go to a place of worship, their sense of community is very strong. It's, it's, uh, it's like 66 you know, percent. It's, it's much higher among that, that smaller subgroup. But as, as, a, as a whole, it's a, a, smaller, a smaller number. Um, so those, those, uh, those, are, those are interesting um, uh, findings, I think. So we, we asked these questions about where a sense of community comes from because we wanted to understand how people are actually thinking that way. Um, and I think when you break those numbers down further, it, it can show some other things. So we also wanted to, act, to look at um, this question of uh, social infrastructure or what you might call amenities or community assets to see how people feel about them. And we um, asked about uh, community parks, uh, community centers or libraries, your favorite restaurants, where you buy groceries, um, your favorite form of entertainment, um, and regardless of whether you go to the gym, a gym. Is that an important thing? Um, what we wanted to, to try to get at here was to understand um, how social networks, how people value um, uh, various types of community institution vis-a-vis -vis some of the more conventional definitions of social capital generating institutions like Putnam wrote about, like voluntary associations and those sorts of things. We wanted to understand in the more informal uh, aspect of the way a community is designed what the, what the effects are. And, uh, and then we also uh, uh, asked people um, whether or not they were within walking distance or a five to 15 minute drive or 15 to 30 minutes or more than 30 minute drive away from amenities to also see how they, how they responded um, and, and, and looked at that against how many of these amenities that they said they were, were actually close to. And we found that um, among those with um, kind of high proximity to um, uh, they, they, were, they were close, within a short drive or walking distance, to um, five or six of these amenities, um, generally more satisfied with their community. And those are pretty consistent. Those numbers are kind of consistent. Is your community a good place to live? Is it a safe place to be at night? Um, you have, you have this, this fairly kind of consistent finding. Again, overall, majorities of people saying uh, yes to these questions. But you'll see that people live in more amenity-rich environments generally tend to, to rate their communities more highly. 
And, and I would say the, the, the results are not a whole lot different for people who live within a walking distance to these amenities and those that are within kind of a five to 15 minute drive. They're fairly similar. And so I think that, that shows that people that live sort of in a suburban context where they can access that stuff by car um, or by bicycle or something fairly quickly are generally as pleased with their community as people that live within a more dense urban and walkable environment. And in some dense urban walking, you, you might be actually close to some of these amenities but not actually think your community is that great, a, great of a place, whereas most people in a suburban context will rate their community a good place as well as be close to, to these things. Um, and then you see, you see these, these results here too. Uh, trust um, is, is a, a little bit higher, it's notably higher, and then uh, whether people get along in your neighborhood, well, maybe less pronounced, uh, and whether people are willing to help their, their neighbors. So, um, so this, this, this question of sort of uh, mix of proximity, uh, mix of amenities to which there's proximity seems to um, matter to, to some degree. And, and here's um, some more questions we asked, or whether you're satisfied with your number of friends in your neighborhood. Um, uh, do, you, your neighbors, uh, do you know your neighbors fairly well? Um, and how often do you talk with, with your neighbors? And so you see, you, again, uh, we don't understand these relationships, and I'm not, I'm not implying any type of kind of causal explanation, but there, seem, there seems to be this interesting qu kind of correlation. Um, and then also, and I'll talk about isolation and loneliness here in a, in a little bit, but we, um, we, we uh, developed an average is isolation um, score along the lines of the UCLA loneliness index, and then we also looked at that against the amenities question, and, and um, the higher the score, the, uh, the more isolated or the lonelier you are. And, uh, and again, we see that people that live in more amenities-rich environments have lower loneliness scores than, than those that uh, don't. And again, we don't understand all of these, these dynamics, but I think those are, are interesting anyway. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that we've created a, a, a manifesto with these survey data for new urbanists, but there's uh, implications for uh, amenities and their proximity. Um, oh, and I, I think, let's see, did I skip? Let me just check something real quick. I might have skipped. Uh, yeah, no, I guess, I guess I didn't include that slide. Um, I can bring that up later. Because we, we, we asked people about um, to... Uh, rate which amenities in the neighborhood they think are important, or what sorts of community institutions are essential to a thriving community. What do you value? And, um, and I, I guess I meant to include that slide, but I didn't. Um, and we asked about more than just the six, six amenities in, in that sort of little mini index. We asked about other things too, like you know, the, is the, uh, um, your business community, um, uh, strong households, these sorts of things, places of worship, um, charities, as well as all these sorts of amenities that, that we, we laid out. And I mean, it turns out that um, schools and libraries are really important to people, uh, kind of, of of every demographic group. Schools, maybe not as surprising. And when you look at when you look at married households there, then that, that percentage jumps even more. It's, that seems sort of obvious. Um, but uh, when it comes to wh which things are essential for a, neighbor t a neighborhood to actually be a successful place, um, people rate schools very highly. That's the, the number one choice. Um, but second is libraries or community centers. People still value these things. Google must have figured this out because they've just launched their big community libraries initiative. And it just, see, it's, on the face of it, when I heard they were doing that, I thought in this di digital age, it seems kind of strange for us when people you know, supposedly don't go to libraries anymore that we're investing in that. But apparently Austin figured that out too, right? Because you've got that, that brand new thing that's down downtown that wasn't there when I uh, moved away. And now um, Google's doing this thing as well. So there's something about that that in um, people's minds, and again, this is, this is, is it's, um, the libraries and schools um, are valued much more by married households, but pretty much other uh, uh, people never married or single, people, people um, who, who live by themselves or people who cohabit, everyone, everyone wants to have libraries and schools in their neighborhood for the most part. That's a, that's a commonly held, held thing. Um, and then grocery stores come in after that. And uh, as someone who has, in all the cities I've lived in, I've always made a decision about where I'm living in proximity to a grocery store. That one made sense to me, but uh, apparently it makes sense to a lot of other people as, as well. All right, so the American dream is dead. Bernie Sanders said that, so did Donald Trump in the campaign. Um, I read an article every week saying that the American dream is dead. Maybe you think the American dream is dead, and so maybe you'll have something to say after I run through these slides. And, um, we, um, in the survey, we asked people whether they were living the dream, however they defined it, um, before we got to the questions about definitions of the American dream. And we asked, are you living the dream? Are you on your way to achieving it? Or is it out of reach for you uh, and for your family? And so um, we found out that 
really it is a relatively small percentage of people. I mean, one in five is not necessarily small. It's, it's significant, significant enough to worry about. And, um, but, but still, it's, it's, in, it's interesting that throughout these various um, groups by income, race, and age, you'll see that um, pretty consistently 80% um, of uh, people will say that they're on the way or that they're living the dream. Um, it's interesting, I, when I've broken these numbers down by other subcategories, um, people who score high in religiosity measures, people who say that um, they, going to a house of worship once a week is something they do, that they pray, that they all, that we, we ask about, those, about four of those questions that give us the ability to kind of uh, arrange people. People who are more religious are um, um, uh, much more likely to say that they're, they're on their way or living the American dream. And, and when they have a low income, they also say that they're living the American dream in very high levels. And then people who are on the opposite end of the religious spectrum are much more likely to say the dream's out of reach. I don't know exactly what that means, but that was one, one interesting finding. Another um, interesting finding uh, in this is when we look at this by working class, um, the definition of the working class that we in the Brookings Institution came up with together last year, we did a working group on the working class that we published last fall. You should go to AI's website or Brookings and download it. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, we, uh, there's several different definitions out there. Our, ours was at least a high school degree um, and not a four-year college degree. So associate's degrees or some form of post-secondary training that's not a four-year college degree, and then incomes in the 20th to 50th per, uh, percentile. That was, our, that was our group. That's about 29 million adult Americans, 9 million children, about 16 million households. So I use that definition for this um, population. And, and interestingly enough, um, the, uh, you don't see a whole lot of difference in the working class when you ask them about the American dream, um, whether they're, they're living it or not. It's really this, this income group below $30,000 of, of income where you see the numbers creep up a bit. But, but uh, quite a few members of the working class in America, despite what we are reading about the working class in the news, actually, when you ask them about the American dream, they, they, they answer the question in an optimistic way. So that, that's, that's interesting as well. Um, but, uh, but when you, when you just ask people, how, regardless of how they define it. Mm -hmm. Is that income after transfers or not? Uh, no. 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 No, it's just reported household income. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, maybe this is too low to the question, but did you ask any of them if they felt that they were patriots? Was that a question? No, but that would be an interesting question to ask. Um, our original survey instrument would have taken 90 minutes to finish <laughs> when we threw everything at the wall. <laughs> I can't remember if we had the patriotism question in there, and then we had to get out the scalpel and first the hatchet, then the scalpel, and try to figure out. Um, my hope is to do several different batteries of uh, iterations of this, asking a core group of the same questions so we can look at this over time, but to add things in as well in the, uh, in the out years. And uh, if I can get the funding for that, I'll do that. And also, you said that you're going to get into uh, what what people have in their minds as the American dream, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. See, like, as, a, as an immigrant myself, I grew up, I was born, uh, born and raised in Mexico, and I know that income doesn't capture everything, but like, it's still is like a, a, a good 20% 20, 20 that makes all, between 30 and 75, and 11% that makes more than 75, that says that it's out of reach for their families. Uh, I wonder what they mean by that. I yeah. Mean, like, uh, 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 I mean, again, I know that income doesn't capture everything, but... Right. Yeah. Well, and it, it doesn't capture everything uh, when it comes to how people define the American dream, it turns out, either. Oh, okay. Interesting. So when you, um, um, oh, sorry, I, I will do one more of these. So um, income and uh, um, uh, educational attainment are the two kind of biggest correlations when it comes to this, this question. For people who think it's out of reach, um, you can see that, that, and as you might expect, people with a high school diploma or less, you know, are in, you know, one in four. Um, believes that the dream is out of out of reach, um, so lower incomes and, and low levels of education, which are obviously themselves correlated, are are um, uh, kind of as you might expect. I didn't find those too too surprising. Thought that might be higher actually. Um, okay, so then we ask people uh, from a drop down menu. You know, here are some definitions people have thrown out over the years of the American dream. Which ones do you think are essential? Sort of essential? Not really essential? Not at all essential? And, and people would check those by by definition. And freedom of choice, how to live one's life, kind of runs away with it. It's interesting that 85% of uh, people in, on the survey said that freedom was important. That's actually pretty consistent when Pew asked this question about 10 years ago. So I think we took this question straight from, from them. They haven't really asked this in recent years. But they got a similar response about 10, 10 years ago. So there's something 
Uh, it'd be really interesting to ask this set of questions uh, in Europe, um, you know, or in, in, in other country contexts. It's interesting, this notion of freedom of choice, not to be told how to live my life, but to have options, whatever people mean by that. Some people might think of having options and opportunity. Other people just don't want elites telling them what to do. People just want to be left alone to, to, to lead their lives. That's an important one. And then having a good family life is also uh, highly important. And it's interesting, too, when you, when you break this, these, these numbers down by various different demographic groups, as you might expect, um, people with lower incomes are more likely to say that um, uh, uh, accumulating wealth is an important part of the American dream. It, it jumps from, it's, you know, for, for the, the nation, it's only at 16%. When you go to people in the under 30,000 category, it jumps up to more like 24%. But they're still much more likely, you know, in, in the order of, I think, 75% to say that having a rewarding family life is, is essential to the American dream, which I just think is, is, is interesting. Um, and then retiring comfortably is a priority. We, you know, we talk uh, a lot about that as in households and at work. If you have a job that deposits money into, into an account, people want to make sure that when they're older, they have enough to live on. Um, home ownership, despite the billions of dollars we spent promoting it <laughs> as the American dream in, the, in every administration up through the Obama administration, I think, um, only 59% say that that is uh, essential to the American dream. And then a successful career is even uh, less than that. So I, I and, oh, and this this was the one I was probably most surprised by. Um, the uh, I mean I I live in a community of people who are obsessed with mobility and social mobility, and there's a new book coming out on it every every month. A number of you are probably interested in this topic. I've spent a lot of time in my own career worrying about these questions, and. And we deliberate about absolute mobility and relative mobility, but everyone kind of believes that you, know, you ought to have a better life than, than your parents, and that seems to be essential to the American dream. Not so much when you just ask people about it. It's, it's interesting that people rated that one as, as, lowly, as low as they did, at 45%. So these are the kind of essential components. Um, if you've got other definitions of the American dream that we should have asked and include in a future battery, I'd be interested to, to know about that. But that these, these are ones we pulled from other surveys and from the literature. Um, and then also, there's been quite a bit written about how the American dream is dead for millennials, too. So just looking at that group um, as well, you see you know, relatively consistent percentages with the nation as, as a whole, not, not terribly different, actually. Um, from the results that we saw on the previous slide for the, for the nation as a whole. So, um, you know, a relatively decent amount of optimism. Um, still about one in five or a, a little less in every group thinking that, that it's out of reach. And again, these were, they were answering these questions before we had presented them with definitions. So this is people just responding to the question, however they um, define the dream. So the American dream seems to have a lot more kind of um, adherence um, just out there around the country than, than we often hear reported um, in, the, in the media. And I think that's, that's interesting and probably calls for some further, some further work. All right, now you're not going to really be able to read this very well. I apologize for that. But we also asked um, a series of questions on loneliness because there, we keep hearing that there's a loneliness epidemic. And we, in looking at the, at the, the media claims and a lot of other claims that we've just seen kind of um, out there over the last year, looking back at the surveys that people are referring to when they make these claims, probably the biggest, most serious one in the last year was one carried out by Cigna that's gotten quite a bit of attention. There's an old AARP study that keeps popping up as evidence that, that Americans are getting lonelier. I don't think the data's pretty incomplete and not, not all that compelling. And so we asked um, this battery of questions about loneliness, but also about belonging. And the two things together, we asked people to do this reporting. And this is consistent with how the UCLA Loneliness Index is con it's constructed, if anyone has ever worked with that or seen it. But we asked people, do you, uh, do you feel alone? Often, sometimes, rarely, or never. Um, and do you, or do you ever feel that you're not close to anyone? Um, left out, lack companionship. These are all the kind of uh, loneliness questions. That your, your ideas and interests are not shared by people. Um, your social relationships are superficial. Uh, people are around you, but they're not with you. Uh, no one knows you well. And you know, you'll see, so the second from the bottom is no one really knows you well. And you'll see that that's 36% um, of Americans say they feel that way sometimes. 13% um, say they feel that way often. So you, you're looking at about half of Americans that would say that they feel like no one really knows them well to some degree. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Up at the top is just the loneliness question, do you feel alone? That's about a third of Americans will say sometimes or often. The sometimes is, is 24%, 8% say often. So it's a fairly small percentage. Um, uh, and and so, the, so those are 
the loneliness questions. But then we also ask these questions of belonging. There are people you can turn to. There are people you can talk to. There are people you'll feel close to. You're an outgoing person. You have a lot in common with people around you. You feel like you're, you have a group of friends. You feel in tune with people. Uh, there are people in your life who really understand you. Um, and you can find companionship when you, when you need it. And when you ask those questions together, you, you learn some interesting things. You learn that even people who report being alone or feeling like no one knows them well, the majority of them will say they have someone that they uh, feel close to and that they're in a group of friends. And so I don't um, want to minimize these claims of a loneliness epidemic, and, and particularly the research on social isolation and health outcomes. I mean, there's some very compelling work out there that when social isolation is a real thing, um, it has other effects that we should, should be concerned about. Um, but it's worth bearing these things in mind, just as, as, as kind of a, a cautionary tale when we think about this, if it's, if it's a legitimate object of public policy. So 73% of those who are lonely at least sometimes say they are close to, to someone. So it's possible to feel lonely sometimes and also to have uh, someone that you're close to. 47% um, of those who are always lonely say they sometimes feel like they're part of a group of friends. 61% of those who are always lonely, not just sometimes lonely, but always lonely, um, say they have people that they feel close to. Um, so we don't understand all of that, um, but we wanted to ask these questions together to see what kind of result we get. And what emerges is just a little bit more of a complicated picture than what I think is often reported. Um, so one third of the people who are always lonely have three to five friends to whom they feel close. I mean, that's a fairly decent um, friend group. Um, and the older you get, the less lonely you are. Um, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot out there about elderly loneliness. And where it exists, it's a very real thing. Um, it seems like one of the major papers runs a, a profile on very lonely elderly people living by them, them, themselves. Um, but in the survey, and other surveys have found this too, the older that you, you get, you actually um, feel less, less alone. Um, in cases where it's real, it's a very real thing, but that's not the trend. The, the loneliest group are people um, just kind of in, in college and right out of college. And then loneliness does co correlate with low levels in income, education and income. Um, but after you hit the $75,000 a year kind of mark in household income, the, the, the difference between uh, lo self-reported loneliness in that group and the people making $175,000 a year kind of vanishes. It kind of goes away. So that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. And there's, there's more that we'll be doing on this. Um, We'll be looking at these data by um, various um, other types of slices throughout the demographic data and probably publishing a couple of other mini, mini reports on those things coming forward. But I think those are, those are um, interesting findings. Finally, um, dog walking actually seems to matter. Um, people who, who own dogs and walk them regularly um, say that they, they know their neighbors well. Uh, 64%, two thirds do. If you own a dog and you don't walk it regularly, 54% of you say you know your neighbor as well. And then people that don't own dogs, so, which means they don't walk them, um, 49%. So, you know, and, they, and, and also those correlations hold for when people say, uh, do you help your neighbors regularly with chores around the neighborhood? Um, do you talk with people regularly? So pretty much all the measures of, of neighborhood satisfaction and engagement are higher with, um, with dog walkers. So. Uh, I, I live downtown Washington, D.C. There are more dogs than children in, in our neighborhood. Um, my 17-year-old um, son noticed uh, this when we moved there and um, started, uh, he started undercutting the professional dog walkers by a couple bucks a walk and promised one-on-one -on -one walks with the dogs instead of the group thing. Uh, he knew he needed to do something because he was a teenager and he's... Um, uh, he's raking it in, um, and, and he knows everybody in our building now. And I've walked through the, the lobby with him, and dogs will come in with their owner, and they'll start jumping when they see him, you know, because uh, and he knows their names, and it's, uh, yeah. We annualized his income if he was doing this, like, five days a week, eight hours. It's, it's, you can you make a pretty good living. You might, you might actually quit your job if I told you the number. Um, the, uh, so anyway, we, we even asked about dogs, and we found that was, uh, was fun. All right, so... Um, repeating myself, but that's always the way I like to wrap up a talk, is, is that um, identity and community are pretty localized phenomena. That is, people derive a sense of identity from their communities uh, to a greater degree than they do their political ideology that's, or, or their ethnic or racial identity. That's interesting to know. Uh, understanding why that is would be additional uh, work that would be worth doing, but I think that's, that's interesting. And then um, proximity to core community assets and institutions matters. That should be matters. Um, and 
again, as I mentioned earlier when I was showing you those amenities numbers, I can't explain what all of that means, but there is something about proximity to these core institutions that um, uh, has people rating their communities higher. Could also be that people choose, you know, better, I mean, better neighborhoods are described by having those amenities, and that's why it's rated higher too, and I suspect that's a, that's a part of it. Um, and then, as we saw in the American Dream numbers, freedom and family are more essential to progress towards the American Dream than some of our more conventional um, uh, understandings of the dream, like home ownership or having a better life than, than your, your parents. And that also is uh, interesting and consistent with things Pew's found before. Um, and then I'm saying friend groups are, and social networks are probably preventing something like a loneliness epidemic from truly taking root. And I'm really willing to be challenged on this whole loneliness epidemic question. I'm just not convinced by what I've seen out there in the, um, in the surveys that have been done besides ours that, we, that, that it's actually gotten worse. And we've, we've, had, we've had pronouncements of loneliness in America going back well over 60 years. Um, the lonely crowd, there's been a number of kind of sort of social science descriptions of America in isolation. That's been a, a fairly common thing over the last 60 years. So um, uh, where it exists in reality, um, I think it's, it's, it's a real thing. But, but to, to try to create a public health, public policy strategy around this claim that we have loneliness epidemic, to me, feels very uh, premature right now. So I, 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 th I think there, that like any survey that you do or any bit of research that you do, um, it raises more questions for additional inquiry. But this is what we found so far and, uh, and hope to continue this, this type of work over the next couple of um, years. So I wanted, to, I wanted to just wrap up by talking a little bit about policy implications. I'm a policy person. I work at AEI. That's what we focus on. Um, I'm interested in other kind of cultural implications as well, but I'd rather hear your, your thoughts on that. Um, one thing that I would say, if you care about public policy and you're interested in these types of findings, I think it's, it's worth right now, not just because of our survey, but because of other work that's, that's out there, um, to look at the role of place in policymaking. Um, I think that it's hard to read um, Raj Chetty and his colleagues' work on the, on the moving to opportunity um, program, if you're familiar with that, and not walk away with the conclusion that upward mobility and place are very uh, uniquely tied together. Um, they find these, these different effects on children that move low-income communities into more intact communities with better schools and intact households. I mean, their, their outcomes in college and in the labor market are much, like, much more like the, the place where they moved than where they started compared to the, the control group. And I, I think that we know a lot more now about um, policy, uh, about the role of place than we did you know, 10, 20, 20 years ago. And so it, it, it should factor into our deliberations in public policies, my, my view. There's a fairly decent body of literature that shows that social networks have very real effects um, on uh, low-income people as well as, as high-income people. We all know if you went to college and you've got strong family friends, you, can, you get help getting a job. And we, we, we know kind of how that social network thing looks and works in, in more upper middle class and affluent communities. But you actually have some of the very same effects in uh, low-income communities. And low-income people who, who find jobs through social networks generally start at um, higher wages and have better effects over time. There's, 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 there's a lot to be said for the importance of social networks. And then we also know that when there's an absence of connectivity among low-income communities and p individuals, the, the, the results are, are particularly bad. And yet when it comes to thinking about networks, and uh, localized networks in public policy, there's not been a lot of fresh thinking about that um, lately. So I think that it's, it's a good idea for us to think about um, issues that we're debating at the national level in terms of local manifestations of solutions. And I'm not suggesting that we just evolve everything to local levels. I mean, if you care about climate change, you probably find a very hard devolutionary strategy kind of hard in, in that regard. Um, but I do think, uh, on, on these questions of inequality that we keep having national conversations about and, and, and policy prescriptions that, in my view, with most of them, I've, if I thought made up a list of the seven kind of leading policy prescriptions that are being proposed right now to do something about inequality, I think they would, would nibble at it around the edges and wouldn't kind of get to the core, which is inequality is very different uh, in different regional areas. Uh, in MSAs experience this very differently. That's another conclusion from Chetty's and others' work is that it's very, your, your experience as a low-income individual and your prospects are very different if you're born in Salt Lake City compared to if you're born in, born in Birmingham, Alabama, for instance. And, and you, you, the, the chances of you moving up are much greater in one city as opposed to another because of a whole range of factors, a lot of which have to do with access to opportunity through networks, through core institutions like educational institutions and, and so on. I, um, 
I'm also persuaded by, by Morley Reinegrad and Doug Ross's book on going local. They actually contributed to a volume we did on localism at, at AEI that, that there's probably something that could be done on the immigration debate in this regard too. I mean, the federal government still always plays the main, the main role, but they kind of envision a system in which cities could actually bid on you know, essentially a, a, set, a set allotment of, of types of, of immigration vouchers. And places that don't want new immigrants don't have to have new immigrants. People that really want a, a lot of high or low skilled immigrants could actually play a role and engage localities in that decision-making process in a way that it strikes me as, as at least worth an experiment, an experiment in a couple of cities. We could talk about other issues, but I think there's, there's not a lot of discussion right now um, at the, the national level on some of these core issues about how you could actually do a better job of solving them if you thought more creatively about the role of local institutions. And so I think revisiting some of the policy experiments in the 1990s when we actually knew a lot less about social networks and social capital could be, could be useful. Uh, so that's what I'll close, close with. I think it's time for us to have some, some fresh, fresh thinking along these lines. I mean, from 1990 to 1996, you saw um, the, um, the proliferation of community policing in the country, the 1994 law that was passed. Community policing has a long history, but once the federal government passed a, a law creating a program for that, it, it, it just swept across the country and most communities moved from this command and control response to crime model to a community prevention model, which in, involves uh, enlisting the help of neighborhoods, community institutions with the police force to prevent crime from happening. Um, you saw the first charter school law in 91, the first, or 92, the first uh, voucher law in 91. Regardless of what you think about education reform, it's had all kinds of effects. I think it's hard to argue with, with, with some of the research out there on charter schools that they've created a new kind of competitive marketplace, at least in some school district, that's been better for all the public schools that are, that are there. And then um, uh, the Hope Six housing program happened then too, which it put the neighborhood at the center of development instead of just housing units, and basically created the same number of units, but in mixed use, uh, mixed income neighborhoods in, in ways that have, have been, I think, more successful for the people we're trying to help than, than the, the way we previously did the gallery style kind of public housing. And um, uh, you had welfare reform, it's probably the most famous one in 1996, most known for its most con controversial provision about work requirements. That's what's received the most attention, the most debate, the most scrutiny. Um, but what also has received less attention, but has received some, was just the role of situating responsibility for moving people into the labor market uh, at the local level. There's, there's some evidence in the literature that secondor secondary devolution from state to more local levels of government created better labor market outcomes. And I think, so I think that there's, there's some evidence that you can actually structure policy in a way that, that presupposes and maybe even requires the use of local institutions, not just government institutions, but other institutions to actually be a part of the solution to a problem. And I would recommend that we spend more time thinking that way these, these days in our bitterly divided times because one, I think we might actually get some better policy outcomes, and two, it seems pretty evident that people care about their communities a lot more than they care about abstract issues at the, the national level. And, and I think if, if, um, if there is flexibility and more goal-based policy where, where you're not prescribing the solution but setting, setting goals like we did in the 1990s and allowing communities to essentially reach those goals through their own uh, management of their own networks and relationships, we might, we might get better policy outcomes and we might actually all get along a little bit better together. So, so that's all. That's all I've got. I'd be happy to, to take any questions you have, or, or just any comments or pushback. Yeah. Um, it seems like you have a lot of data that you gathered yourself and or with your team. You know that you're looking at there. How much do you cross with then just other data sources and demographics? I was thinking when you looked at loneliness, I was thinking about like suicide rates and how you could use you know those kind of numbers and then cross that with your right. stuff to see if then there are segments that it's kind of highlighting that or something like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's one of our kind of next projects. So we, um, what we, we this is all geocoded data. And so even though our sample is not big enough for us to go in and find like a, a community that's been hit hard by the opioid epidemic and create a profile out of our own data for that. What we can do is find um, respondents that live in sort of uh, culturally and demographically similar t sorts of communities and, and then look at the loneliness numbers with the, the, the communities that have high rates of opioid use, high rates of suicide. We haven't done that yet, but we can. And I think we'll find you know, some pretty strong correlations there. So Ryan, I want to you close with a uh, return to the 90s ex policy experiment. It's always dangerous to go back to the past well, as a I'm, conclusion. Well, I'm curious because uh, my question is, whether, you know, and you also characterize it as a time when we really didn't know anything. 
or less? We know we more less. now. Yeah. As a policy guy, do you sense there's, and this is just my very weak sense, that there's a, a, a growing risk aversion to that kind of experimentation? There's, there's a much greater fear of failure and that it's actually impeding that sort of you know, ignorance is bliss kind of experimental yeah. time? I don't actually know if there's a fear of failure, um, but I do think there's a growing ignorance among policymakers about the, um, the role of community institutions. And by community institutions, I'm not just talking about mom and pop sort of nonprofits. I'm talking about chambers of commerce. I'm talking about you know, entire school districts. Um, um, you know, actual institutions that have some scale at the community level or the, the regional level. Um, they're, we, we know a lot more now than we did back then, as I said, because we've done a lot more research just on the, the value and, and effects of social capital of, of networks. And, um, and yet we seem to be using it less than we did back in the day when we actually didn't know as much as we know now. I'm just wondering um, if, if there's, you know, we've kind of tightened up the accountability cycle. And mm -hmm. so there, there's more fear, sort of more instantaneous backlash to the yeah. slightest sense of failure. And I just wonder if that's that, getting that in the could, way. That could, you know, th there might be something to that. I'd have to think about that some more. Um, what I think is interesting is that this, this wasn't all done in a vacuum. We may have done a lot more interesting social science research on, the, on, on community institutions, social capital, all those things. Um, but there was an interesting kind of body of work leading up to the, the 1990s that talked about the importance of community institutions and whether it was to empower people or, um, uh, I mean, Nisbet's book. I mean, you can go way back and find this whole, there's kind of this tradition. Back when we didn't have to worry about model identification. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of lack of that there, that's for sure. But, the, um, um, but what, what I think is, is interesting is that during that time, if you go back and you look at the 1996 um, party platforms for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and then you compare that to the 2016 party platforms. Just read the preamble, and it's a totally different, it feels like a very different America. You have in the 1996 party platforms this um, call to um, solving some of these pressing problems like poverty and mobility um, in a way that enlists the resources of our neighborhoods, our communities, our families. This, there was this, this sense of localism, which was kind of in the vernacular at the time. And it'd be interesting to try to figure out exactly where all of that um, came from. I, I think there was, some, there was some kind of reaction to great society programs in, you know, not just in the 90s. The 90s was the culmination of something that had started throughout the, the, the 1980s. You saw uh, doubts about whether this public house, you know, the, as a crap epidemic, the crack, the crap epidemic, the crack epidemic was was uh, expanding. <laughs> if there there might have been that too, <laughs> I haven't heard about that one. Um, the uh, as that was expanding, uh, you know, throughout the 80s, and, and crime was being concentrated in these areas, it looked like the way we were were doing public housing was just a bad idea, and and also. Uh, I'm surprised at how many people that even work in social welfare policy don't remember this, but um, just about every governor in America was running a, an experiment with welfare reform. That, that, was, that was made possible in a, in a bill in the early 1980s that Reagan signed that allowed waivers, like we have now in Medicaid, to, to allow people to experiment with things like having people you know, do job training while they're receiving assistance and all that. And that created, and a lot of those were being evaluated as well. And so the, the results became sort of hard to argue with, and that was why Clinton said we need to end welfare as we know know it, and this idea that we need to rely on local networks, chambers of commerce, charities, churches, whatever, to get, get involved in helping people move into the labor market seemed like a sensible thing to do because this trying to run welfare from, from Washington wasn't working very well. So there, was, there were a number of events that kind of preceded that. And you look at those party platforms in 96, right at the tail end of this, this season of policy and innovation that I'm talking about. And that language of community, neighborhood, um, safe streets, strong, you know, good schools, all those things are, are a part of it. When you fast forward to 2016, both Democrats and Republicans, it's, it's, it's the state and it's individual people. <laughs> and, and it's going to be the, the party's going to elect someone who's basically going to take on all these huge national issues on behalf of, of, of the American people. And the language of, of community and locality is almost completely gone. And I think, I mean, I think you saw that with the Republicans in the Tea Party election. I mean, that, they, they were reacting to Obama. They were going to Washington to solve all the problems Obama was creating. They were going to get rid of Obamacare. And the, the, the stimulus bill was a disaster. And, um, and you really have a new crop of policymakers, even on the right that don't speak that kind of conventional sort of Tocquevillian language. And, and it's, really, it's really evident in the party platforms when you look at them side by side. So there's a, it's an ignorance of some kind or a lack of care. 
I've got a, a couple of questions. One is uh, whether or not AI put this puts this data up on GitHub or Dataverse or anything like that for other researchers to play with, and if you guys have thought about that. And we, then, we will, but we haven't done awesome. it yet. Yeah, just, uh, our, just our reports available. Um, we, we'll probably make the, the data available at some point next year. Okay, and then the second is, um, I didn't see any mention of religious organizations here, and I wondered if you guys had included that or if you just not found anything there, um, if that's in we upcoming did ask, surveys. Yeah, you mean in terms of just community institutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, the, the slide that I thought was in there that I forgot to put in there that I was mentioning on community amenities, when we asked people what's essential to a successful neighborhood, we, we, we asked about religious organizations there, houses of worship. And because uh, America has fewer people you know, involved in a house of worship than it used to, those percentages are still smaller. You know, in you know, people think grocery stores are more important than houses of worship. But if you regularly attend a house of worship, you think it's one of the most important community institutions. And we did ask um, that, that uh, series of questions about religiosity. <coughs> um, you know, what, what, how important religion is, do you go once a week? Or do you participate in activities sponsored by a religious organization? And you definitely find uh, people in religious communities have much lower loneliness scores. So religion and neighborliness seem to mitigate loneliness uh, very clearly. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, de Tocqueville uh, earlier. Are you, do you believe your findings are consistent with uh, what de Tocqueville wrote uh, 200 years ago? Um, yes and no. What's, um, what's I, I've heard, that I think there are a lot more yeses in terms of what you found than there are no's. What, what are the no's? Yeah, so I think yes in the sense that um, people have an attachment to place and they, um, they care about it more than they care about you know, distant bureaucracies. And in that way, it's consistent with Tocqueville's findings. What we found, and I didn't put these up here just because I, it's sort of a different talk. We asked all the kind of Putnam questions about whether or not people have uh, actually participated in a voluntary organization or shown up at community meetings and that sort of a thing. And those numbers remain kind of consistent with, with what Putnam found. It's still a minority of us that are actually engaged in our communities. And so that um, New England township where people are meeting in the meeting house in the town square meeting to solve the problems um, is, is, is something that's distinctive. And it was, it was this observation that's really helped us understand the America that Tocqueville was, was visiting. But it, it doesn't look like it's the natural practice or instinct of most Americans to actually participate in voluntary organizations. It's interesting. People say they live in a neighborhood where people are willing to help each other. Three and four people say, yeah, people in my neighborhood, if someone needs help, they'll help them. And you say, have you ever helped your neighbors with anything? That's more like 35%. <laughs> and um, uh, and what's interesting is if people have um, uh, joined together with neighbors to solve a community problem, they're pretty likely to do it again uh, if they've done it. Once you, once you do it, you kind of want to do it again. Um, people who um, are married, people who uh, go to a house of worship fairly regularly, and people who talk to their neighbors regularly are more, much more likely to say that they've actually worked with neighbors to solve a community problem than the opposites of, of all of those things. So there is a spirit of engagement, but it's, um, it's, 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 um, it's got certain characteristics. But it, you know, the majority of us are not joiners. Hi, uh, hi Ryan. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that 20% that or that, that 20 to 25% that are um, unsatisfied with their community. And in particular, maybe for, you know, the, as, this, as these surveys go on, if you have enough data to look at community disruption, um, and that can be a various things. It can be opioids. It could be a natural disaster. It could be gentrification. Yeah. Um, and what effect does that have not only on satisfaction with the community, but on other, yeah. like more, uh, you know, just more general measures of, uh, of well-being? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, no, that, that, that is something we also are going to endeavor to do is to actually look at kind of all the, all the outliers. You know, we've, you know, what's been interesting about this is the, how the majorities kind of counted the narrative. But there are these significant, you know, minorities of people that we don't totally understand. So we, right now we've only done this in terms of our own survey data. So we know that people who are dissatisfied with their communities are they're more lonely. Uh, they're much less likely to talk to their neighbors. Uh, they're not involved civically. They don't go to church. Um, they... Um, uh, generally um, are uh, lower levels of income and education as well. And, and that shows up in our data too. What, what Murray and others have in Putnam found in their, more, in their latest books is that um, working class Americans is less engaged in their community, low, low income. It's actually low income people in our survey are more likely to say they talk with their neighbors more than that kind of that middle group. Um, 
but in terms of people who are dissatisfied with their community, they're farther from amenities, they, they're, they're less engaged with their neighbors, they, um, they have lower levels of, of income and education. Um, what, what we don't know is how those numbers play out in other available data about like where the opioids hit hard or where there have been external shocks and the factories have closed and that sort of a thing. And that's, that's something we, we can do, we just haven't done it yet. So I have a couple of questions. Let me get to my, to my, my list here. Uh, I think one is a follow-up to the gentrification one that, that he brought, brings up, and, and you already said that you haven't done that, that yet, but uh, um, I wonder if there's any questions in the survey that had something to do with diversity of the community. So one of the things that I think uh, the diversification uh, discussion that we actually had here a couple, couple months ago now, um, there's this, this notion that communities get disrupted by different people moving in, and that creates all, all sorts of uh, problems. You mentioned dogs. We had a, a report made by UT that apparently the east side of, of Austin now has more dogs than kids, and people are outraged by that. And maybe it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> they know each other more. Exactly. Yeah. They might know each other more. Now there's a causal effect of being We happier. didn't actually ask people, do you walk a kid in a stroller? We should have asked that. You know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, but is I had a couple of young singles actually doing the survey instrument with me. So, no, I, so. is, is there anything that you are able to pick up from the, the questionnaire that you had that, that that has to do with the diversity of the community that kind of not as much as we that. probably should should have um, and that would be that would be a great uh, additional question or questions to do um, going forward um, we did ask for people's uh, opinion on whether or not um, people immigrating from another countries um, that uh, our policy should be the, the openness to that is a good thing for our, for my community or it's a bad thing for my community and those results shake out kind of like you would think um, working class white Americans see that as a much greater threat um, than than other people do and higher levels of education are much cooler with that and and people of color are much cooler with that as well so those those results kind of look look like um, what you would expect um, we had we had an original question in there about um, racial diversity. It was a self-reported thing of the community that we decided with NORC to take out just because we figured that looking at the actual numbers of a community rather than people's perceptions of it might, might be better. Because um, we, can, we can look at that in relationship to some of the other responses that we have. But we should probably revisit that. Um, how about, uh, I was thinking when you were talking about attitudes towards the appropriate role of the state in solving community problems and attitudes towards uh, the role of business in making communities uh, a better place. So I, I wonder if there is at least a correlation between the level of satisfaction that community members express based on those attitudes ab ab about it. And especially now, like nowadays, that, that perhaps at the, fer the, sorry, the nationwide debate is more towards things such as uh, the new Green Deal, uh, the, the Green New Deal, sorry, the Green, Green New Deal and things like that. They are more like grandiose, in, at least in aspirations and scale. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I wonder, uh, or, or that corporations are evil and uh, they, are sh they're, they're, they are part of the problem, not part of the solution. So I wonder once that you zoom in, in a community, how that, that may be different yeah, and, and right. that may change. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so in that slide I didn't have that I thought I had, when we asked people about the, the things that make their community successful, we included the business community in there as well. And, and I, because I don't have it in front of me, I can't remember the exact numbers. It's right about the middle of the pack um, in terms of people saying it's, it's essential for um, a community to be a successful one. Um, and uh, so higher, higher than you know, charities, um, higher than houses of worship. Um, when you look at those, uh, I was just looking at this uh, yesterday on my way here, when you, when you look at the, the various groups, um, people who are married are more likely to say the business community matters, more, even more than, uh, it was significantly more than people who cohabit, which I thought was interesting. Um, I don't know, understand that. But the, um, uh, and then the older you are, um, also, the business community matters. So, but you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't find among younger people um, or people of various levels of education, any real um, low numbers with respect to the business community. It's kind of, you know, most people, you know, about half people think it's an, an important part of making the community successful. You don't, there's nothing that emerges that people have, have um, put horns on the head of local business anyway. And 
that's probably consistent with how people feel about local everything. You know, I mean, you know, we know that you know the, the the famous Congress one. You know, everyone hates Congress, but they like their member of Congress. But that shows up in other ways too. When we ask people, um, do you think the U.S. economy is going to be better or worse uh, 12 months from now? Uh, a majority say it's going to be better, but it's more like 75%. And then we ask, what about your personal situation? About 90% of Americans say their personal situation is going to be better in 12 months. I actually looked at the working class results for that. The working class, um, as we've defined it, are more optimistic on the U.S. economy than the more affluent, more highly educated counterparts are. They, by a few, by about four or five percentage points, they think it's the U.S. July 2017, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so yeah. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. No, yeah. no, July 18. Yeah. 18, yeah. 18, 18 which yeah, it yeah. wouldn't surprise me at all that yeah. things are going really well for a group of people that now worry about what's happening in the news. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. I would say though, th those are aggregate working class numbers, and the working class is more diverse than most people think. When we talk, when we, when it's being used a lot in the media, it's code for white working class, but um, working class America is, is more, it's, it's gone from about 66% white in 1980 to down about 52%, I think, now. Um, and so, um, so those, those responses fat, are, are um, fairly consistent by, by uh, racial subdivisions within the working class. But, but you're right. I mean, that's, that's, also, that's also a factor. But they, um, but you know, setting aside the, the view of the nation, they still have a much more positive view. Like 92% of working class Americans think that their personal situation will be better in 12 months. So we kind of see that in, you know, in every category. When you, when you bring things closer to home, people are just generally more optimistic about that, that issue. And, and I, it looks like the, the business community in my city is just a different thing than the, the faceless corporation or the, the tech titans out in Silicon Valley or the banks on well, Wall Street. Well, grocery stores is, is, is one of the important things for the quality of life, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, very much like so. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Brian, I'm not sure how much uh, cross-sectional variability there is in this, but do people have a view on how they'd like to see their local area govern or administer them, mayoral versus county versus things I don't, like I don't that? know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We, we just know, consistent with what I was just talking about, that people like their local governments a lot more than they like the federal government. And that's been consistently trending for a long time. I and mean, Pew's tracked that for a while. Our results look almost exactly like, like Pew's and um, where Pew's are today. That that a minority of Americans trust the federal government. The state governments in between, you know, that's been a declining trend since the 1980s, like the federal government has been. But it's this weird sort of resilient, sort of two thirds to three quarters of Americans have confidence in their local government. Which, no, I mean, no reasonable person thinks that it's less prone to graft or corruption or they're more transparent or, or whatever. There's just something about knowing that the people that are representing you are close enough home that you could protest them or write a letter or show up at a meeting. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, why, why people continue to feel that way about their local governments is, is I don't really know, but it's been very consistent over time. Um, since people much prefer their local government, what's the big barrier that's preventing us from more localization, like you were talking about at the end of your presentation? Yeah. Um, well, I wish I fully knew the answer to that question, because then I would actually know what to do. Um, Can I answer but that? I, yeah. The Democrats? I, I don't know. No, just. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I, yeah. There's been, there have been so many incentives. Um, I'm sure there's a money in politics explanation for this. There's so many incentives to nationalize so many problems. So I, I, I feel like I at least have a theory of that in, in making about that on the national level. And some of this gets back to what I was talking about, just in the way the parties have been sending people to Washington with this expectation they're going to fix things. Um, uh, when you get down to the state and sub-state level, that becomes a much more complicated and probably varies by state as well. Um, whether or not, and, you know, in, hey, John, and you could, uh, actually, I was just going to cite John's work, and uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> let, let you answer the question. Um, what, what prevents kind of a more localization of governance in, in certain contexts? And, and I, um, I, I think that, there, well, there certainly was a movement to consolidate you know, things at, at more regional levels at, as well. There was some of that for efficiency reasons. Um, but I, I think that as a matter of federal policy, there's one, this kind of just ignorance of the, the past issue, which I think is a very real thing. And then the incentives, conversely, for people to go to Washington to fix problems on both the right and the left. That's become just the, the trend over the last 20 years. 
Um, more than 20 years, right? I mean, that would bear. Yeah, more, more than... It starts in the early 19th, 20th century, right? And then it keeps growing and growing and growing. Yeah, sure. No, and I mean, there was some, something happened around 9-11. I've got a colleague who has a whole 9-11 thesis about this whole so thing, the, too. The, that, the, 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 the ribbon of change is there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, I, I don't know. There, there just seems to have been much more of an awareness of the importance of making sure that we had community institutions and local units of government involved in, in solving these things. But when... Um, but when you get to the state and, and municipal level, you run into a whole bunch of other set of problems too. I mean, you, you can also make the case that, that localism is the driver of some really big problems that we have now. Cost of housing, um, barriers of entrance to the labor market because of occupational licensing and non-compete agreements for low-income workers. I mean, those are generally things. That, well, some of the occupational license is usually a state thing. but. Um, there's that interplay, which uh, is, is always at work there. But what, when it comes to um, greater municipal competition and how you get more of it, I don't, I don't actually know what, what you actually do. Maybe, maybe you know. It works well. It works well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It works well. Also, for, for, for all of our policy at Macomb's guests, we do a podcast that uh, uh, is going to be in our, in our page. And we did one this morning. And we sort of talked about this. Uh, I don't know if, how familiar you guys are with the, the work of Lynn Ostrom but a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And she worked a lot about how uh, go, commons problems can be solved from bottom-up uh, approaches instead uh, top-down interventions. But she also highlighted the fact that it's very natural for individuals to think that there, if, if there's a complex problem, that requires a centrally planned top-down intervention to be solved because knowledge problems, because of scale, and all of that. So I wonder if, even if you think that local governments are more accountable and, and so on, you still may think, oh yeah, no, but with this problem, we need, we need the bulldozers, right? Uh, I, I wonder if that's part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, there are very legitimate um, questions to be raised about supra-local uh, bodies that to which people can appeal for certain types of, of things like we're seeing you know in you know in, in land use decisions you know being maybe at the top of the, the list there where people are just priced out of, of, of areas in, in ways that they don't really have an, an ability to confront and there might you know there's a there's there's a kind of you know th th this is not just the subsidiarity such that the lowest unit is always the smartest and most efficient there I think there's a very real sort of debate to be had about that stuff on some of these these, these issues um, and then there are other ways of getting at it too, but it's a good question, and I wish I had a better answer for you. Uh, yeah, let's go here and here. Um, <clears throat> so, given all of this and given everything you say, why don't people vote in local elections? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> There's obviously not a relationship between voting and trusting your local government. <laughs> um, uh, that there, there's a lot on that, and um, I think that um, there there is something to this uh, notion of proximity where people just they feel like if they need to do something they can. If things are bad enough they can, but they don't necessarily feel feel com compelled to, to do it. I don't know. Do you have a, do you have a, a theory on that? So, no, it's a. Um, well, uh, I, I will preface this by saying, as a resident of Austin, Texas, I have extremely low confidence in my local government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very important preface. I, I, I think that, and you, you're talking about the, um, you're talking about this, in, this focusing on national stuff over the last 20 years. Um, I, I would argue that the problem is a lot on the demand side. I mean, you just, people, for whatever reason is out there, they want to elect, they just want to elect a good president. You know, I, we had, um, we had a, a, an extremely, con three years ago, we had an extremely contentious election, local election over Uber regulation. Yeah, I lived here then. I remember okay, so that. Yeah, yeah. You remember yeah. What, just what an awful experience that was. I remember. But I, I voted. I remember like, being at church during that election, and I would be talking to people about like this hugely important local issue that, oh, by the way, could have bigger national implications than you know anything that's going on at the presidential level in 2016. And I would get these like blank stares, and people would be like, I just want a good president. 
<laughs> yeah. Does anybody know what the turnout was like for that one? I don't. I never. Uh, looked, yeah, uh, for that thing, was it? Uh, was it? It was a smidge under twenty percent. So it was a lot. It wasn't any so different than other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Not as many people use Uber as you think. Um, Which is yeah. The, very good for a May local. Election. Yeah. Yeah. Usually <laughs> May election. I mean, local turnout. But but what's yeah. interesting, I guess the, 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 that election turns out to be this thing where people are fighting. this like you know the the somebody from outside coming in and telling us what's doing in our community. That mm -hmm. wasn't turning it around, right? So I think consistent with that notion that oh, oh no, that's you're talking trash about my community now. Yeah. So we're gonna yeah, how, how dare you, right? So was, uh, yeah. There was there was that on that side, and one thing I was gonna. Going to say, and it just yeah, after my original non-answers, I mean, there is there is something to just the, the the nationalization of of policy interest. I mean, we really, you know, when we're consuming news, however we do that through the our digital platforms that we use, or our radio, or um, uh, cable TV, um, it's it's there's not a whole lot of debate about what's going on in the local community, and that is when it comes to policy and politics, that is where most people spend their their time. And I do I do quite a bit of radio around the country, and I actually I that's one of my favorite. It's so much more fun than national stuff is going into local radio, and I'm sure some of you've done that too. It's fun being a guest on someone's show. But what amazes me is how even local radio, like radio stations in Michigan or in Louisiana or wherever. The talk show host is always talking about national issues. They're they're talking about Trump, or they're talking about Pelosi, or they're talking about whatever. And uh, and so even though they're, instead they're not talking about Michigan, you know. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the the explanation is for that. I mean, we, we know the story about local papers being decimated, and the you know, and the paper industry kind of going out of business at, with the rise of the internet and all that. Um, it does seem like the introduction of online technology and digital media has, that's played a role in terms of polarization, right? I mean, people, we spend all our time reading what we believe and people are, are more divided. You know, have, the division started growing as the proliferation of those things were, were, made, were made possible. But there's also, there's something fundamentally weird about just human DNA and our kind of abstract tribalism, you know? The earliest reference I can see to this was David Hume in 1752 saying something ha is happening in modern era where people are, get, they, they join parties of principle and not parties of interest. And they get really, really animated to the point of taking up arms over ideas and principles. And he didn't have the term ideology or, you know, but he did, he did use the term abstractions. And where he said our politics used to be determined by um, agriculture, city, shipping, you know, very sort of localized interests. But now something strange is happening in modern times, he said. Orwell wrote a piece in 1946, I think, called On Nationalism, where he was fishing around for a word and he landed on nationalism, but he wasn't quite using it the way it's being used in our current uh, political debates, where he observes the same thing and he looks at it in the history of Europe saying there's something about the power of categories that you can actually mobilize people. You can actually make people take up arms over ideological constructs much more than you can get them to show up and protest potholes. You know. Um, they might complain about the potholes all the way to the office, but then when they hear there's a pothole march, you know, um, down on Cesar Chavez, you know, on the way to City Hall, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something else that day, you know. But I will fly all the way to Washington D.C., you know, for uh, uh, something on the mall with, with 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 some cause. Yeah. I only give it to somebody that pays very close attention to the topic. I was teaching. Um, I do have an, a different answer, which is not so much about sort of this emotional. Okay. No, no, good. Please, please respond. I, I want to give a, maybe another hypothesis to this question of why people don't vote in local elections, which is they also have the right of exit. So if I don't like what's going on in my town of Westlake Hills, I can move to a different part of Travis County. I can move to Round Rock. I can move to Pflugerville. I have a lot of options to leave if I don't like what's going on in my little municipality. I can't do that if I don't like what's going on in Washington, D.C., or at least it's much, much, much more costly. And so I think one of the reasons you see people care a lot more about national elections than local elections is they know they have this right of exit. And so in cities like Chicago, where people maybe don't have a right of exit to eat as easily, you do see a lot of more tension in local politics in the city of Chicago or in the city of New York. But in most municipalities, it's easy for me to move out of the city. So if the city decides to do something crazy, I just move to a different part. And I think it's another reason you don't see people get as upset because they can always just leave. Yeah, that's true. Good point. I need the last question again. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> since y'all said there's going to be a discussion, this isn't much a question. Is yeah, go ahead. Connected go for it. Some of this. It's interesting that every time that I've uh, 
spent a week in Washington doing this Washington campus thing and then other speakers that have come in and it's always like, why is Washington broken? And and to a person, they will say like, one of the biggest things is that congressmen don't stay in DC and actually, you know, yeah. work out things. They just, and what's so funny is that then you listen to these sound bites of all these newly elected congressmen that are all like, I'm going to spend all my time in Michigan. Like that's a promise I'm making to you. And it kind of like plays to this, this idea of that like people want that local feeling like that. And, and we're too stupid to realize like that is not what we want our congressmen to do. We actually want our congressmen to spend all their time doing the thing that we have elected them to do. But like now that's, we, we want that feeling of mm-hmm. feeling so special and feeling even more connected to my congressman and yeah. at the detriment of Congress not even working. So yeah. it's just, we're, we're kind of asking for it. So. Yeah, no, well said. And uh, the, the, the pressures now that are on people running for Congress to prove to the people in their district that they're not going to become part of the problem have led to these extremes. They're, they're not going to become part of the elite. They're not going to, so they're going to sleep on their sofa. I mean, there's like 135 members of Congress that sleep in their office. I swear the, those office buildings smell different than they, they <laughs> used to. And, um, you know, they, they sleep in their office, then they go back to their districts to, to, to not become a part of, of the, the issue. And, and um, at some point, that seems like that's, that's got to change. Um, they spend a lot of time, uh, just, this is just, uh, Hill staffers that have been around there a long time uh, working on various committees and stuff all have the very same story. I mean, they, they just don't see their bosses hanging out with their colleagues like they, they used to. You know, using time when they're not on the floor and they're not supposed to be doing something official to be sitting around in their offices actually talking about things. Um, and I think, that's a, I think that's a problem. All right, to wrap up, I have a question about AEI. Yes. So, you know, I, I, I follow AI very carefully on, on, on Facebook and all the you know, writings and reports and so on. And um, uh, I used to say that, no, I used to say, I like to say that, that today is the best day for humankind and tomorrow is going to be even better. And AI has a pattern of putting stuff out that's pretty much demonstrating that, that today is the best day in humankind and tomorrow is most likely going to be better. And here you are again coming in with another piece of data on like, listen, things are actually pretty good. And, and, and so... A question is, in that building, in D.C., where everybody around you thinks that the world is catching on fire and we need to do something to fix the world, and you guys seem to be like, come on, th- things are actually pretty good. <laughs> are you, like, seem as this weird Pollyanna people walking around or, 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 or there's well, a particular juice yeah, in the place? I don't know. <laughs> um, there, well, we, Charles Murray is a colleague of mine. And well, tomorrow will be much sure. worse than today. <laughs> and, uh, and Wednesday will be much worse than Tuesday. Um, yeah. Nick, yeah, that's right. Uh, Nick Aberstadt's yeah. prognosis for uh, working America not so good. So it's not. Thinking about AI. Yeah, yeah, not, 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 not always. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I didn't go looking for these results. We really didn't know what we would find. And, and obviously, there's there's stuff in there that shows we've got some problems that we have to address and understand. And and we say very clearly in our report, we're not papering over any of that. I just thought it was important when we were rolling out this initial summary of findings to say, when you talk to Americans, they just sound different than what people are saying they sound, they're supposed to be saying. You know, and even when I look at working class Americans in our report, they're just not, they're not as mad, you know, and they're not, it's like the bring out your dead guy. You know, it's like, you're, I'm not dead yet. And it's like, yes, you are. And the Monty Python <laughs> sketch, and he's like, I'm not dead. And, and uh, I feel like people are saying, you're miserable. The only and people are saying, you're I. Because you, you're, you're not in the internet. That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. The people are saying, I, I'm, I'm not really miserable. And, and, and we're saying, yes, you are miserable. And, and so I, I think if people are saying, I'm not as miserable as you say I am, and that's actually worth, worth reporting on. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's plenty of, of, of gloom and doom. You know, if, if, if gloom and doom is what we see in the, in the data on the, on the horizon, uh, our, our scholars say that too. I joke about this, but that, there's, there's a reason. Uh, in terms of uh, an educational point of sense, sense, I think our, we don't necessarily teach the data that shows us that how particularly good life is for our uh, nation, but for the mm-hmm. world overall. We don't teach that. I think the probably read Steven Baker's new book. I like that book a lot. Yeah. There's a book that shows, like, come on, let's just make, make a case for where we are. Now, cool down, everybody. There's a yeah. lot here that's basically human progress is, like, really, really strong. And, yeah. and we see that in all sorts of dimensions all over the world. Mm-hmm. And and I feel that, that for maybe the reason of, of the sense of elected officials, they don't tend to focus on that thing. Right? Mm-hmm. They, they tend to be focused on the things that, oh, I got elected, I need to be fixing something. Yeah. So let's not focus on the good things, let's focus on the bad things. So, so yeah, uh, and it is hard to get. I and other groups have on, on educating people is actually 
very important, right? Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, when the, and, and I do have scholars, uh, you know, colleagues who have done done a good job in in various, you know, whatever their issue is in in, in doing that. So we do kind of have that that reputation. But I think it's it's interesting that you know, Ameri it's it is hard to get kind of rank and file people really fired up about some of this stuff. They too, they can around election time, but you know, Americans don't end up caring about the causes of a movement, whether that's on the right or the left, the way that the leaders of those movements um, show. And that shows up in survey data too. You know, people just want to have a, a better life tomorrow than they did yesterday. They don't necessarily want to go fight inequality, the vast majority of Americans. Uh, and it, 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 it's a problem for all the reasons we say, but it's hard to get people fired up about that. They, they, would, they would much rather know that they're gonna, their kids are going to get a good education and that they have opportunities to increase their, their, their prospects tomorrow and that, and that their community is going to get better. They care about that stuff. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Brian. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah.